Hi, I'm Dave Dolby with the Shooter's Log, presented by Cheaper Than Dirt. I'm here with Brian Hardy. He's going to give us some legal analysis. We have three cases pending that the Supreme Court has already heard oral arguments on. We're hoping to get some decisions this, uh, this summer, soon, possibly one of them on Monday, I heard. But um, we'll see what happens with that. Brian, can you go through the first one? The first one's going to be guns and domestic violence protection orders, the United States versus Rahimi. Now, Rahimi was a bad actor, we know. He was uh, later convicted, but originally accused of, of multiple shootings, domestic violence, hit and run. Yet the police came in, found the guns because he had the protection order. That's the main one that we're looking at. We know about the other stuff, but he wasn't convicted on anything yet, yet they still stripped him of his Second Amendment rights. Now, can you give us some analysis on that? Yeah, so what we're talking about here is so whether you're 18 U.S.C. 922, which prohibits uh, the possession of a firearm by a person um, who is subject to a domestic violence restraining order, right? Mm -hmm. and, and whether does that particular prohibition violate the Second Amendment? And in this particular case, they looked at that and they thought, you know what, at the Fifth, fifth, judicial, the fifth District Court, um, uh, Circuit Court decided no, uh, yes it did, it was unconstitutional, um, and decided that they needed, that it did violate the Second Amendment, which is why this case is U.S. versus Rahimi. It's the U.S. government has appealed this court, this case to the Supreme Court on those issues. Um, and, and I think that this is one of those questions where you have to wonder what the U.S. Supreme Court is going to do with it, right? Are they actually right. going to, you know, look strictly at the statute and look only at the uh, interpretation of that and find out whether it does or does not violate the Second Amendment, or do they expand it into the facts and potentially get lost in the facts and we end up with bad law? Uh, again, my hope is that, consistent with what the Fifth District did, um, they find that this particular section is unconstitutional because nobody's been proven guilty, innocent. You're still in that limbo stage, right? right? There's, there's, there's allegations, um, but there has been no conviction yet. Now, Similar to the red, red flag laws. Right, right. Now, Bruin v. New York, already decided by the Supreme Court, put in uh, the, the conditions that you have to look at history. What was the precedent? What was the original founding father's intent? That's what the lower courts seem to have relied on saying, no, that there's nothing in here that the, you know, the founding fathers would have kicked in your door as soon as you had a gun because you, know, you had something you know, going wrong at home, and, and sort of seem to go down that route with it. Do you think that the Supreme Court will follow that? Do you think the Supreme Court, okay, we don't want people flying planes into buildings, you know, 2001, but are, are they going to go that route? We're going to have TSA, we're going to have, you know, we're going to give up certain liberties and that to do this? Do you think that they'll go ahead and go with the original intent and say that this needs to be handled another way? I think looking at some of the more recent precedent out of this particular Supreme Court, um, I think we're going to see some original intent coming forward on this one. I think they're going to like the analysis of the Fifth District underneath the Bruin matter, right? I think right. they're going to look at that and they're going to say, you know what? I don't think that these guys, this was originally intended that you're going to give up your right to defend yourself uh, when there's nothing been proven by you, by the state, by anyone else. There's been nothing proven against you yet. And so I think, I would hope, um, that the U.S. Supreme Court sides consistent with what the Fifth Judicial the Fifth District did and, uh, and affirms that we, those rights are no, no good. And again, this goes into all these, if they allow for this, we've got all these red flag laws that are coming in. It could be a very slippery slope. If they open up this door and allow for this to be able to, uh, to stand, then what happens with red flag laws when it's now not even the state coming in and saying, hey, look, we've got criminal allegations against you, but it's just your neighbor, your ex-girlfriend, or whatever it may be. Concerned mother. A concerned mother <laughs> says, gee, my son's been going through a depression. He broke up with his girlfriend. He owns some firearms and I'm worried about him. Come in and get all those out of here all of a sudden stripped your Second Amendment rights, not based on any law, just a feeling. None of us want a bad thing to happen. None of us want a mass tragedy to happen. But what rights do we have to sacrifice and would it make a difference anyway? And this will feed into the argument for those people that are proponents of red flag laws. If the court comes down and finds in favor of the United States in this particular case and determines that yes, this is okay to go in and preemptively take somebody's uh, constitutional rights away from them, then again, the proponents of red flag laws are going to be calling this a victory and they're going to be moving forward with those laws so that you, know, you could potentially be stripped of something without anything more than a simple accusation. So it's concerning, but I'm hopeful Definitely. that we have a conservative court now that right. uh, will follow the true intent of the Constitution. That's damn <laughs>
see our next kind of, our next case is guns and the chevrons chevron deference so this is a uh, regarding bump stocks right uh garland v cargill yep. and again this is a case where the government seems to have overstepped instead of going through congress going through the law the gun control act of 1934 1968 all of that this is just regulatory agencies now the the chevron deference if i'm understanding this correct is that the courts aren't experts in a lot of these things so they go ahead and they defer to regulatory agencies when there's some ambiguity in the law trying to say you know how should we rule on this please give us some guidance on this but this was really just rulemaking from politics an event uh, here in Las Vegas, yeah. right? Close to you October and I. October 1. Yeah, we're, we're both here from Vegas. We both know First mass shooting in the U.S. Dozens killed, hundreds uh, injured. He used a dozen guns equipped with bump, bump stops. One after them. Just one person intent on not worrying about the law anyways did this, which originally called uh, President Trump at that time called for this. It's been amped up over President Biden where now this is becoming another one of these slippery slopes where it could go down to pistol braces, triggers. If they don't like sights on a gun or something like that, they just suddenly declare, we're gonna re reinterpret a rule. Is, is that what's going on? So yeah, so like you talked about in Chevron, so when a court, you know, they don't have a level of expertise, a lot of times statutes, unfortunately, legislators, legislators on the Hill aren't um, exactly you know, there's ambiguities, there's not exactness in their phrasing, um, there's potential questions as to what something may or may not have been intended to mean. Mm -hmm. And so the regulatory agency then has to pick this up, right, and now run with this legislation that was passed to figure out how do we apply it to the actual one of rubber hits the road, right? right? And in doing that, they come up with rules and they do rulemaking stuff. And we've seen a lot of the rulemaking that ATF has engaged in recently. Um, and courts are generally going to give deference to those rule makers because they're the ones having to deal with the rubber when it hits the road, in my example, right? Um, and, and so they try to give deference to them within reason, right? right. And that's going to be the key here is whether something can be reasonably interpreted to be that way. Um, other, you know, and, and so when they're looking at these particular, and this particular regulation, the rule, for example, um, you know, the court, the lower court actually came back and said, you know what, uh, this is unambiguously that a bump stock is not a machine gun. And therefore, this looks more to be politics inserting itself into rulemaking than regulators simply looking at what was the legislative intent and trying to apply the rubber to the road. And again, the hope is, is that while most deference is given to them, they are held in check, and I think it would be a good thing, um, irrespective of which party or political boundary you lie on, nobody should want regulators with a agenda, with any agenda, one way or another, um, coming down against you simply because they have power, right? No, or, or just literally making a new law, yeah. turning hundreds of thousands of people overnight into a felon. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there is things where um, they're what's called friend of the court, where they can go ahead and submit a brief. This is our opinion based on our experience. can be on either side. Second Amendment Foundation mm -hmm. often does that. And it seems to me that this could just as easily, instead of deferring to this agency to give them the answer, they could still just submit the brief, submit their opinion, and then the justices are making more of a decision instead of an agency trying to make law and circumvent Congress. Well, I think to get standing, they needed to make sure that they went ahead and created the rule, that somebody had to challenge the rule, and that's how it gets into the court system. Uh, but it, on this particular issue, you know, we have an agency that went too far. And, and what a surprise, government might go too far. <laughs> so, <laughs> it <isn't> so. <laughs> it never happened. And in this case, government appears to have gone too far. Um, and I think that this is an agency that has that, that potential um, to go too far, and it's been shown to go at least too far in the minds of many Second Amendment holders often, right? And um, they take um, very small nuances in regulation and create a whole body of rules, because it's not law, right. they, they seem to sometimes think it's law, but create a whole body of rules, and when those rules go too far because they're no longer tied directly to the legislation, but instead they're tied to policy and agenda, I think it becomes a dangerous sport. And that's what we're engaging in right now. What we're seeing is people are, and regulated, regulatory bodies are engaging in this particular overreaching 
And I really do hope that the uh, U.S. Supreme Court looks at this and says, you know what, you went too far. Um, and, and sets this precedent that you know agencies need to, if they wanted to have this change, they could always go to their legislatures. See, that's what's amazing about this is you and I can go to the legislature, but guess what? The regulatory agency, they can go to Congress as well and say, hey, Congress, why don't you make the law clearer on this issue or the other? But those people there are subject to electors, right? And right. the regulators aren't subject to re-election or anything else. And so they can create as wild a thing as they want, and sometimes it oversteps too far. And nobody with an election has to pay a price, right? Nobody has to have their name on a vote, yep. on a record. And this all came about that the definition of a machine gun versus a non-machine gun was one pull of the trigger, one bullet versus one pull of the trigger, multiple bullets, yep. machine gun, and then the bump stock, because of the slide action of the stock, was actually causing the finger to come through complete reset and create a new motion. That's why back in the Gun Control Act of 1968, they updated what they had done in 1934. Instead of saying a pull of the trigger, they would say an action of a trigger. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, Justice Barrett, in her argument said, you know, she thinks this is a machine gun. This is a machine gun, but it doesn't meet the regulatory language of what you said was a machine gun, and thus had a concern that. Um, that, you know, that, that again, government agencies mm -hmm. were just stepping up and making law, and somehow I'm guessing that Congress is gonna answer the ATF's call for mine. I'm not an expert, haven't tried it out, but while I have access to them, I think that they have a lot more access. They're just making an end run. Well, and if they want, again, if Congress wants to make this law, let Congress make the law, not the agency. And then let Congress be held accountable for the law that they've made. Um, but you can't go around and say, look, we're going to have these agencies make the law because we're, we want them to so that we don't have to answer um, to our constituents for what's going on. And so I, I, think that, I think that she's probably right in that aspect in the fact that this is something that the legislature needs to make a decision on. It's not for the courts. It's not for the agency. This is something if the legislature wants to do it, let them go back and make, try to make that change. But this isn't the right place to do it. Agree. Okay. And our last case is, uh, is actually not a Second Amendment case, it's a First Amendment <laughs> case, okay? This one's kind of an, an interesting case. It's the NRA v. Blue, and it's, it's about um, the superintendent of the New York State Department of Financial Services. She comes out after the Parkland, Florida shooting, the school shooting there, and, and, and urges, urges in a, in a non-binding memo, uh, financial companies saying, hey, are you sure you really want to risk your reputation by dealing with uh, anybody in the gun industry? Uh, as a result, the NRA, NRA insurance services, a bunch of people pulled out, wouldn't get, you know, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work with them anymore. You know, in my opinion, it's a little bit like Al Capone saying, I didn't have a gun, I just made a recommendation to him while all my henchmen were standing around me with guns going, are you sure this is what you really <laughs> want to say tomorrow in court? It, 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 it seems to me it's pretty straightforward, yet it is a First Amendment case. And, and, and again, just playing devil's advocate, it could, lead to a, it could lead to a slippery slope on the other direction where every time the NRA doesn't like something, they say it's a First Amendment issue. So tell us how this all plays out, how it all, uh, what's the legal analysis, so to speak. <laughs> this is an interesting one again because we're dealing with the Second Amendment group um, that really has a First Amendment issue, like you said. And so um, again, you've got New York regulators out discouraging, and that's, the, that's, that's something that's, you know, they're not out there outright saying you can't, you shouldn't, you must not, here's a, here's a law, here's a regulation, but essentially discouraging, maligning at some level, um, these companies and, and saying, hey, look, do you really, 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 really want to do business with them? And when you've got a government agency that government, as we know, has a lot of power over insurance and banking and all the rest of these things, they're highly regulated in industries. And, that want to have a good relationship with their regulatory bodies and that bodies are both federal and state right, right. and they so one of those bodies is the state they want to have that good relationship with them and if that guy comes in that you need to have a good relationship in for all of your other business and says are you sure you want to you risk, want to risk everything using their official office, yeah. office okay while it was a non-binding memo 
it, you know, that doesn't mean it wasn't on stationary. That doesn't mean this isn't a private citizen or even a government employee as a private citizen out there on a talk show or something. This is someone sending this out specifically from their office. At, at that point in time, I do believe it creates coercion under the First Amendment. And, and that's it's a violation, uh, you know, in my opinion. Again, I'm not the justice sitting up there, but I think that one of the most sacrosanct things we have, the reason it is the first of all of the amendments is our freedom of speech, right? We have a right to have an opinion, to express that opinion, and not to be retaliated against for that opinion by, by the government, right? Now that doesn't mean that you and I can't disagree. Absolutely, right? If, if there were to be a public outcry and a company decides to say, you know what, as a result of public outcry, I'm going to go ahead and take action against this particular, I'm not going to carry guns inside of my store anymore. We, we saw that a while back, right? Um, and, and then the public outcry also on the other side of that gets to say, fine, we won't patronize that store, right? That's how the First Amendment works, right? People can take a position, businesses can take a position, and both sides of that can decide how that business is going, whether they're going to do business with that business or not, but the government. The government doesn't get to take that position and go in and essentially coerce people not to do business with somebody else. In doing so, they've harmed them, um, they've harmed many of us, and many gun companies who are sitting in that same similar situation. I mean, really, the NRA is standing in front of, in this particular case, every other gun owner business because I, I know many of my clients who are gun owner businesses who have trouble having banking relationships because sure. of this particular issue, right? And so the NRA is taking it head on for themselves, obviously, but for the rest of us as well. And so I give them comments on that as well. Definitely. Now, correct me if I'm wrong on this, I'm not the legal <laughs> scholar in this discussion, but one common misconception, the First Amendment doesn't mean you can say anything, anytime, anywhere. It's really just a protection from the government stifling your speech under the right conditions. Well, it can be both, right? Because we have defamation actions that stem mm -hmm. underneath the First Amendment, so that stifles an individual, because you can't say anything, right? Um, it, it, there are certain protections that we have as individuals from other individuals, right? Mm -hmm. um, they can't malign you in a way that harms your business, or there's, there's a whole group of, of law out there on defamation, whether it's gonna be talking about loads and diseases and you know, all different types of things that you can accuse people of. It also protects people from being in danger, right? Yelling fire in a movie theater, right? Exactly. That's not a First Amendment right, that you, know, you don't get to go create chaos with things. But the government itself cannot begin taking positions on things or forcing businesses to take a position against another business, another operation or another entity by using their power and influence. That's coercion, right. um, uh, and it does violate the First Amendment. So the First Amendment absolutely be at the heart. It, it is at the heart of everything, right? Is that we get to have different positions on things. We get to do that, and businesses get to operate. Now, a business can choose, but they can't choose under undue influence, right? right? I mean, if you're dicks and you want to choose not to sell firearms, that's your choice, and you'll, you'll, you'll bear the market consequences for that. But you don't get to have that choice because you were coerced into making that choice by a government agency. That's it. I appreciate your time. Again, this is Dave Dolby for The Shooter's Log. Be sure to like and subscribe. And for all of your legal needs, Brian, tell us about a little bit about you and what you do. You're always welcome to reach out to us here. We're here at Marquee Arbach. Um, we're here in Las Vegas. You can get a hold of us at 702-382-0711 or check us out at maclaw.com. And you do a lot more than just personal, obviously. You represent a lot of the major firearm companies within the industry, do or have. Yeah, we, we do. We take care of a lot of litigation for many different companies and then some, do some advising and consulting on things as well. Thank you.